And yes, I'm the one that's po poisoned the whole lake. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Mark. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't do it alone, certainly, but I'll be talking, <laughs> talking today about what happens when you put fish on the birth control pill. And we know that the pill is a really effective form of contraception for humans. We also know that the pill is getting out there into the aquatic environment, so is it as effective uh, contraceptive for fish as it is for humans? So that's the main focus of my talk. A lot of my talk is on this fish species here, the fathead minnow. It's a species that's very common in North America. It's used a lot in lab studies, toxicology studies, so we know a lot about how it behaves, how it responds to estrogens in the environment. We also know that it's an important source of food for a lot of sports fish. So it's a really key organism in a lot of freshwater systems. So when I talk about this whole lake experiment we did, I'll, I'll use the word we a lot. And that's because there was a huge group of people involved. A lot of them are at Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And that's the key group that organized and conducted the study. And that was the group that I worked with before I moved to the University of New Brunswick. We also collaborated with a number of researchers at, uh, at uh, universities across Canada and in the US, as well as the Environment Canada and US EPA researchers. So you saw this paper uh, during Marcus's talk, um, what motivated us to do a whole lake study. Well, it was really the, the papers that were coming out in the mid to late 1990s especially the work that was being done in the UK showing a very severe disruption of sexual development in male fishes. So you heard that when they went out and they collected fish like the roach here and they dissected the fish and they looked at the testes of the males, they were finding eggs. And in some areas of the UK, 100% of the males had eggs in their testes. So this condition of intersex was quite common and much more common in systems that were receiving a lot of wastewater discharge. So there's a very strong link between the exposure of these fish to wastewater effluents and the, and the presence of the intersex. The other thing that they were finding in the UK was that when they looked at the blood of the males, they found egg yolk proteins in the blood. And these proteins are normally only produced by females when they're maturing their eggs. And so what they suspected was that the males were getting exposed to estrogens through the water. These estrogens were traveling through the blood to the liver cells, which is where these proteins are normally produced. And uh, that was the response. The males were producing egg yolk proteins as well. So there's been a lot of research um, that's been motivated by this kind of work, ours included, to look for the presence of intersex in wild male fish as well as using that egg yolk protein as an indicator of the presence of estrogens in our rivers. So is it just a problem in the UK? Well, no, it's not. We've done a number of studies across the globe looking for feminized male fish in our rivers. We've seen it in a number of Canadian rivers. There's, there was a great study in the US showing intersex in bass um, in a number of systems here. So these are just headlines from some of the news stories that have covered studies that have found feminized males. And there are also a number of uh, European studies as well um, showing presence of feminized male fishes in, in systems there. So the big question was what was causing the feminization? You already know that estrogens are the key culprit, but there was a lot of background discussion, background work to figure out what it was in the wastewater that was causing this response. Because wastewaters are a soup of chemicals, so we know there's a lot of things that are getting flushed down the toilet, down the drain, that could potentially be interfering with the endocrine system in these fish. We also know that fish reproduce uh, they use, when they reproduce, they use estrogen and testosterone. These are molecules that are very similar or identical to the hormones that you and I use to control our reproduction. We know that when the males respond and produce that egg yolk protein, they're getting exposed to an estrogen or an estrogen-like compound. So we really suspected it was, it was an estrogen or, or an estrogen mimic. Uh, 
Initially, we thought it was compounds that come out of detergents, so nonal phenols were a target for quite a while. But that detective work ultimately showed that it was mainly the estrogens because they're so potent at very low concentrations and causing this feminization response in male fish. So they linked that feminization to estrogens. We know that male fishes had smaller testes. They were producing eggs. They were developing egg yolk proteins. That's why we wanted to do a whole lake study was to look at that bigger question of what does it mean to have feminized male fish living in our rivers? So can they still successfully reproduce or is there going to be an impact on the population size, the sustainability of those fish? We also, because we often do lab studies where you're exposing a single species to a chemical, you can't look at food webs and interactions of a number of species within your system. So there's very little known about what happens um, when you have several species being exposed at the same time to an estrogen. And the question about population level impacts is a really difficult one to address in rivers receiving municipal wastewaters because there's all sorts of stresses that are, are also affecting fish populations such as low oxygen, maybe loss of habitat, fishing pressures that really make it difficult to know whether your declines in fish numbers are because of estrogens or because of other impacts in the environment. So this is a really simplistic view of an aquatic food web. And, and some of the organisms here are the ones that we studied in our whole lake experiment. You have algae at the base of the food web that are fixing carbon, and that carbon gets transferred up the food web. You've got bacteria that are recycling nutrients. At the second trophic level, you've got invertebrates that are either floating in the water column or living in the shallow waters, feeding on the algae and the bacteria. Then you've got small fish that feed on those invertebrates and then large fish that feed on those small fish. So there's, there's a real reliance um, at, between all these organisms and a movement of energy up through the food web. And what we wanted to do with our experiment was look at all these organisms together because there's the potential certainly to impact the numbers of fish, but when you take and you reduce those numbers of fish, what, what could happen to the organisms that they feed on? So it was a great opportunity to look at the dynamics of a system when it's exposed to estrogens. And we also knew ahead of time that these were the, the organisms that were likely to be the most sensitive to estrogen exposure because these are the ones that use estrogens to control reproduction. But really, there was very little known about the invertebrates and whether they would respond as well. So where did we do the study? Where do you get permission to add estrogen to a whole lake? Well, not very, not very many locations. This is a research facility in northwestern Ontario. It's called the Experimental Lakes Area. And it was set up in the late 1960s for research. So these lakes um, have, there have been a number of whole lake experiments that have been conducted looking at impacts of nutrients or acidification on food webs. And it's a very powerful approach because the only manipulation, the only stressor in the system is the one that we add to it. So you can look specifically at how that stressor affects the ecosystem. And for those of you that don't know, this is where New Brunswick is. So that's where I live now. So this is a Canadian federal government um, facility, and it's the one that I had the pleasure of working at when I was a research scientist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. This is an aerial photograph of the lake that we chose for our whole lake experiment. It's called Lake 260. It has one, <laughs> one stream flowing into the lake, one stream flowing out into a much larger system. We chose it because it has the fathead minnow in it, so we wanted to look at how those minnow responded. It's also deep enough to have a top predator, the lake trout, in it. So we added the estrogen to the lake. We also chose it because it has long-term records of water quality, plankton, and fish populations. So this is a, an overview of our study design. We started this in 1999. In the first two years, we spent a lot of time looking at background uh, populations, communities, what's there, how much is there. We also had to figure out how much estrogen to add, how often to add it. Um, so we did a lot of background work those first two years. 
And then in spring of 2001 until September of that year, and again in 2002 and 2003, we added very low parts per trillion levels of estrogen to the lake. Right away, we started to see effects on individuals, um, later on populations. And then for the last six years, we've been looking at recovery of the system. So I'll touch a bit on what happened after we stopped adding estrogen to the lake. We're also collecting similar information on our reference lakes because we wanted to be sure that any changes in the population that we saw was because of the estrogen exposure and not because of natural variability from climate. We decided to use the estrogen, the synthetic estrogen that's used in the birth control pill for our experiment for a number of reasons. We know a lot about how it affects fish from laboratory studies. We also knew that it was being linked to the intersex condition that was seen in wild fishes. We knew that we could add it to the lake at very low parts per trillion levels and cause male fish to produce that egg yolk protein. We also knew that much, much higher levels um, would cause acute or short-term lethality. And so we felt we could add it at very low levels and not kill off the organism. So there was a big margin of safety there where we could cause estrogenic responses but not lethal effects. And we also felt that because it's an estrogen, the results that we saw in our study could be, could be extrapolated to the other estrogens that are out there in the environment, the natural estrogens that women excrete. And so this is the natural estradiol that we use to control our reproduction. This is the molecule EE2, synthetic one. It's just different from the estradiol because it's got a two-carbon chain on it. And that two-carbon chain makes it more resistant to metabolism in our bodies, but also more persistent to degradation in the environment. So how do you dose a whole lake? It's a common question I get asked. It sounds really tough, but it's actually not very difficult. So you take the mass of estrogen you need, you dissolve it in solution, you pump that solution into the propeller wash of the boat, you drive the boat around the lake for about 15 minutes, and you dose the chemical to the lake. And, and the physical action of wave movement mixes the chemical very rapidly in the surface waters. We chose our target concentration of 5 nanograms per liter based on what we knew was in municipal wastewater. So it's within the range of what's been measured in effluents. And this was our, our actual concentration, so between 4.8 and 6.1 parts uh, per trillion. And just to put in a bit of context, when you look at the demographics, the use of birth control pills in Canada, we were adding, every day we were adding about what was used by a city of 200,000 people, so the mass of EE2. So were there any effects on the base of the food web? Well, we went out with this really high-tech tube sampler that we picked up at the hardware store, took a sample of the water column, looked at all the organisms living in the water column, and I'm just going to cut to the chase and say that there was nothing that happened. So all of the algae, the bacteria, Supporting the base of the food web, there was no changes in the abundance or the composition of the community. So it was pretty boring. What happened at the next level? The plankton, the, the zooplankton that live in the water column, or the insects or other invertebrates that live in the shallow water. So we had traps to catch them as they come up from the water. We also used this tube sampler. Did we see any impacts of the estrogen on those invertebrates? This is the only slide I'm going to show you from that trophic level. These are, this is the mass of this crustacean in the water column every couple of weeks over these uh, years of the study. And you can see these are the three years we added the estrogen, and there was absolutely no change in the abundance of the plankton. Uh, no change in the community composition of either the plankton or the nearshore invertebrates. So again, it was pretty boring. Now on to the much more exciting part of my talk. <clears throat> what happened to the small fish? I'm going to focus here on the fathead minnow again. We also collected similar information on this dace. This is a very short-lived fish. It matures at the age of two, and then it typically reproduces once over the months of June and July, it often dies off right after it reproduces. And uh, it's a very small fish, it's about this big. 
put it in some perspective for you. So we started adding the estrogen to the lake in 2001. Did these fish start producing this egg yolk protein, vitelligenin? So these are concentrations of vitelligenin on the y-axis. These are all the dates that we collected, the minnows from either refer our reference lake or our experimental lake, females and males. And the black bars, you can see here, these are data collected before the estrogen was added. And this first bar, those are individuals we collected about seven weeks after the addition started. So right away, the males produced a lot more vitelligenin than you would naturally find in them. Females also started to produce a lot more of this egg yolk protein. So there was a very dramatic response at the biochemical level. What happened at the tissue level? So did we see delays in egg and sperm cell development? Well, if you take a female fathead in the spring, you dissect out her ovaries, you slice them and look at them under a microscope, this is what the eggs look like. So there's a lot of these really large, protein-rich eggs that are almost ready to be released and fertilized. What happened once we started exposing the females to estrogen? Well, this is what the eggs looked like. They were much smaller, and they were also at an earlier stage of development. So the estrogen was delaying a female's ability to mature her eggs. Now, we went back after the estrogen, after we stopped adding it four years later, and the egg development has recovered. So that's great news that once you take the estrogen out of the system, give it enough time to recover, um, or, or degrade the estrogen that the fish can actually recover um, to normal egg cell development. What happened to the males? Well, this is what a cross-section of a testes looks like in the spring. It's full of these, all these dots are sperm cells. This is what a male looked like the first year after we started <laughs> adding the estrogen. So it's the same scale. The testes were much smaller. They also contained a lot of fiber. The sperm cells were at an earlier stage of development. In the third year of the estrogen additions, we also saw males with these eggs, so the intersex condition that we saw downstream of municipal wastewaters. And then again, as you saw for the females, once we be went back four years later, there was complete recovery. So they were developing their sperm cells as normal. So here we've seen that they responded at the biochemical level. They started producing that egg yolk protein. They also had delayed sperm and egg cell development. What happened at the population level? Well, we went out in the spring and the fall of each year, and these are data from the fall and collected the fathead minnow. We looked at the numbers. This is a length frequency distribution. So you've got the size of the fish on the x-axis, the number of fish on the y-axis for all of the years of our study. And this shows you the relative abundance of the young fish versus the adults. So these white bars are the babies that were hatched that year. The dark bars are the adults. And you can see the relative abundance of young versus adults in the population. Some years, um, the young are, are a little bit larger than other years. Some years, the young are a lower proportion of the population. And this is very typical for small fish. They have good years and bad years for reproducing. So there's a lot of variability naturally in these small-bodied fish in terms of how their population changes from one year to the next. You can also see in the panels here that these are our catches. So these are the numbers of fish we would catch per hour, per net hour. And that one, some years we catch a lot, other years we don't catch very much. So what happened when we started adding the estrogen to the lake? Well, these are the two falls before the estrogen addition began. This is the first fall of our estrogen addition. The second fall, we lost a lot of those young. So there was almost a re reproductive failure in the summer of 2002, again in the summer of 2003. And we had a few adults remaining in both of these years. Um, but our catches certainly dropped down in the second and third year of the experiment. We also saw very, very few, a handful of fathead minnow in the two years after we stopped adding the estrogen. And then, to our surprise, this population recovered with a re, um, an amazing 
number of individuals in the fall of 2006. So there's a lot of sex going on in the lake this summer with the adults that were there. They must have had a great time. So we actually saw the population rebound to what it was before we started the estrogen exposure. So this is really great news as well that they've recovered at the tissue level and they've also recovered at the population level. What happened? Oh, I'll just mention here. So we saw a decline in their abundance. We also saw a slight decline in another small-bodied fish species as well. What happened to our top predator? And this is a very long-lived fish. It matures when it's six years of age. It'll spawn every second fall until at least 25 years of age. And we looked again at this vitelligenin in blood for the lake trout. These are males on the top and females on the bottom. The black bars are from our experimental lake and the white and gray bars are from our reference lakes. We saw the same kind of response in the males, much higher levels of vitelligenin than in our reference uh, individuals. But the females sometimes would produce more vitelligenin than the reference uh, fish, but not always. So there was some responses in this species at the biochemical level. But when we looked at the ovaries and the testes from the lake trout, there was no delays in egg cells or sperm cells. So even though they were responding at the biochemical level to the estrogens, it wasn't causing any impact at a higher level of biological organization. But when we looked at the numbers of lake trout, and these are long-term data on the numbers of lake trout we have in our experimental lake and a, a reference lake, we saw a drop in the fall of 2003, so the third year of our estrogen exposures. And we lost about 30% of our population between 2002 and 2003. The other thing that we saw was that the lake trout were getting skinnier, so their condition was going down. So this is a healthy fish. The fish were starting to get uh, skinnier for their length. And when you're skinnier, you don't produce as well, you don't survive our cold Canadian winters as well. So the, these are the condition data here for Lake 260. We saw a drop in how fat they were for their size in the fall of 2003, and we didn't see this drop in our reference lake system. So what could be causing that drop in the population when there wasn't any changes in sperm or egg cell development? Well, what we think is happening is that the, the lake trout were being impacted because they lost their prey. Their main fish that they liked to eat was disappearing, so they weren't eating as much. They were losing weight. Survival went down. Um, and that's why we saw the drop in the population. And this is really something that we don't think about as ecotoxicologists very often, is we often focus on what's happening for the direct effects, the individual species that are being impacted directly by contaminants, but we don't often think about those indirect effects. When you take away a prey, a food source for some, for some species, what happens to it? So those kinds of indirect effects we saw in this experiment, you don't um, we don't think about very often. So back to my original question, is the birth control pill an effective form of contraception for wild fish? Well, yes, we showed that it's as effective for humans as it is for fathead minnow, because we saw a near extinction of the fathead minnow population. So just to wrap up with some of the conclusions from our whole lake experiment, we didn't see any impacts of the estrogen on the algae, the bacteria, the invertebrates, at the base of the food web, we saw declines in the fathead minnow population, um, less so in some of our longer-lived small fish. So we think that depending on how often you reproduce, how long you live, that determines how susceptible you are to estrogens. So if you only reproduce once, you only live for a couple of years, maybe you don't, you're not as resilient to estrogen exposure as other fish species. We also saw that you can impact a fish population directly from the estrogens if you can impact the, the ability of the fish to reproduce. <coughs> but as we saw for the lake trout, um, you can have indirect impacts on the population because you take away the food supply and subsequently influence its ability to reproduce. The good news is that <laughs> once, you give, once we gave the lake enough time to 
break down the estrogen that the fish, the minnow population recovered. So the question I'm often asked is, should women stop taking the birth control pill? And the answer is no. That the, it really, the answer lies in better wastewater treatment. And you'll hear in, an, in the next talk that there's a lot of options out there to take the estrogens, the estrogenicity of wastewaters out before the water is discharged into <coughs> our streams and rivers. So just some of my thoughts, too, about the, the broader field, not just from our experiment, but what, what determines an organism's sensitivity to estrogens or an ecosystem's sensitivity to estrogens. But well, we know that if you use hormones like estro estradiol or testosterone to control your reproduction, you'll be much more sensitive to hormones like those used in the birth control pill. So those are certainly... It's certainly something we and others have seen. Oops. Uh, we also know that if there's no escape, then you're more likely to be impacted by the estrogen. So there's a lot of small fish that tend to stay in their little area in rivers and streams. If they happen to be living downstream of a wastewater discharge, there's no escape for them from the exposure. Whereas other large fish tend to migrate long distances in rivers and their exposure is likely reduced because of that. Also, if you don't have any ability to move individuals from upstream or downstream to rejuvenate the population, that, that kind of species is likely more sensitive to estrogen exposure. <coughs> Ecosystems are more uh, sensitive if you're in a receiving environment where there's a lot of effluent discharge and very little dilution. So those estrogen concentrations of the estrogens would be much higher. Or you have very little or <coughs> poor wastewater treatment. The other uh, thing I would like to throw out there too is that there may be some impacts of climate. So in Canada we live, some of our areas, our lakes and rivers are covered with ice for four to six months of the year. And that reduces the amount of sunlight, um, bacterial activity that might be breaking down these estrogens. So maybe there's more impacts of endocrine disruptors in colder climates where these kinds of chemicals will stay in the system longer. 